Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to show you how I managed to take this image of the Pac-Man Nebula from here, my rooftop balcony in Tokyo, Japan, using this little $500 smart telescope, the ZW Seastar S50, and cheating a little bit, more details in the video. Oh, and by the way, this video is sponsored by Brilliant.org, more later in the video. Today I'd like to address some of the comments that I saw on my first video about the uh, ZW Seastar S50, and I saw exactly the same comments back when I was testing and reviewing the Dwarf Lab Dwarf 2 smart telescope as well. And I feel like these comments apply basically to all smart telescopes out there, whether they're from ZW, whether they're from Smart Lab, whether they're from uh, Vaunis with the uh, Vespera or other smart telescopes out there. And the comment is basically like, oh, this is a toy. This is not for serious astrophotography. This is just like a toy. And they're very dismissive. Some of the comments is like, oh, this is a really nice toy. And that's kind of like my approach to things. I think it's both like a toy and a tool at the same time for all of those competent smart telescopes. And so I wanted to make a response to that by basically using the Seastar S50 from here in Tokyo, my rooftop balcony, to take images that are pretty much in-depth of some of the nebulae that I sometimes struggle with from here in Tokyo, like with this incredible light pollution. And so for tonight, I'm going to use the Seastar S50 to take a picture of the uh, Pac-Man Nebula, which is a really, really cool item to see. And while if you're living like in the suburbs in a typical US town, uh, you're probably in a much less light polluted area than I am, and you can make do with just the narrowband light pollution filter that is in the telescope, which is going to be more than enough for me, I have decided that I needed to cheat, or actually maybe not even cheat, I just needed to use some serious astrophotography equipment, not like this this worthless toy here, to, to basically make the serian, seriousness of the whole equipment a bit higher, and for, for that, I'm going to be using this Altair dual band narrow band filter with four nanometer band passes. Very narrow, very good for light polluted areas like here in Tokyo. And together with the Sea Star, we're going to have a toy plus serious astrophotography tool, which means that we'll have some good astrophotography equipment in the end. So how is that going to work? How am I going to use this uh, dual band narrow band filter together with my C star? Well, I actually introduced a solution in a previous video. This is using a 3D printed uh, adapter ba made by my friend Luke from the Lucomatico YouTube channel. And it basically looks like two parts. I can take a filter, slot it in one part, sandwich it, between uh, the two separate parts and then use some screws to hold them together. Here we are, we have a delicious and expensive filter sandwich because that filter in and of itself is worse as much as the entire Sea Star. <laughs> and to install that filter on the Sea Star, I just used the 3D printed uh, delicious looking filter sandwich and slot it in and we are ready to image basically. One thing of note, if I'm using a narrowband filter, I've noticed that I get better results if I also set the light pollution filter within the Sea Star Telescope to on. I suspect that their UVIR cut filter might cut a little bit of H-alpha, I'm not completely sure, and I need to do more tests. But for tonight, I'll be using the narrowband filter together with the internal narrowband filter. Normally it's a no-no, uh, but it's working fine and that's what we'll be using. Of course, I will have all of the links to both like the Sea Star Telescope as well as the filter that I'm using down in the description if you're interested. Now I will wait for nightfall, I will put the Seastar S50 telescope on its tripod, plop it on the ground, turn it on, and then use the application to point to and autofocus etc on the Pac-Man Nebula. So let's do that together, I'll show you how it looks like in the Seastar application. So what I like to do is go to the Sky Atlas, or you can also tap on the search icon and look at tonight's best. So for me, I'm going to look at this uh, Pac-Man Nebula target. So I'm going to tap on it and you can see we have the altitude of the target right now, 48 degrees. It's going to go up to around maybe 70 degrees. And then by 4 a.m. it will be down to 30 degrees according to this uh, chart here. So this is a great candidate because one of the things is that the sea star cannot track accurately 
uh, be after above 85 degrees. So uh, this one never hits that. It means that we should be able to image this target throughout the night without issue. So this is exactly what I am going to be using. You can also see that there's a little like recommendation filter here. This means that the internal light pollution filter in the telescope will be turned on automatically for this target. So I am going to tap on uh, go gazing and the telescope will automatically uh, slew, point to it and center the target. You will not have to do anything. You can see as it gets close to the target, we have this blue rectangle. The blue re rectangle represents where the sea star thinks it is pointing. And it will adapt itself. You see that it was wrong. And now it's like basically correcting itself. And so you can see the blue rectangle going back to our red rectangle target. And we're now centered. So I can uh, click on the uh, top left arrow to uh, go back to the main menu. And this time I'm going to tap on stargazing. And this is where I'll be able to see what's, uh, what's happening here. Now, the first thing that I want to do, you can see we, have, we see stars in the image, is I'm going to tap on AF for autofocus. And we're done. The autofocus is complete, so we should be ready to uh, image. You can see that the filter icon here is uh, green, which means that the light pollution filter has been turned on exactly as we expected. And now my next step will just be to press the red button here at the bottom, and this will start the imaging. After that, I can close the app, reopen it later to see what's happening, but can leave the telescope to work on its own. Since I'm going to be imaging overnight, uh, I will also connect the telescope to an external battery. And we are done with the capture. In the end, uh, across the night, I managed to get around five hours of data on the Pac-Man Nebula. And we are also close to the full moon, by the way, with the full moon is always terrible for deep sky astrophotography. And of course, I took the, these images uh, using the save each frame option in the C-Star application to make sure that I have access to all of the single raw frames that were captured to the telescope and so I can stack them myself in my processing software of choice, which is PixInsight. It meant that I had 2000 frames of each 10 seconds. So that's a lot of processing power that is required to actually churn through all of those raw frames, each about five megabytes in size, and that were all stored on the internal memory of the telescope. To put it on the computer, you just connect the telescope to the computer via USB-C. And while we're waiting for the stacking to be over, I know that with the C-Star telescope and other smart telescopes, many people have been brought into the hobby. And what's super cool as well is that there's a lot of people that have been brought into the hobby that do not have really an engineering background or a scientific background. And because this hobby can get so deep and so involved, I've seen a lot of people that are now playing catch up on those topics. And what would you know? I would say that the best way to actually catch up and, and do more than catch up, actually learn new things uh, in terms of science, computer science, engineering, etc. is Brilliant.org. Brilliant.org is a site where you can learn interactively and using bite-sized lessons that are really easy to understand with a really good and well thought out progression curve. You can learn mathematics, science, physics, and all of those good groundwork that is used for astrophotography and many other disciplines. I use Brilliant.org almost on a daily basis uh, because it has tons of lessons that are available and it adds lessons all the time. And it also has those really well thought out courses that I can just follow to learn in depth about topics that I used to not know anything about. And these days, I'm still going through a machine learning course that is on Brilliant. And that's because I've seen a lot of machine learning and AI-based software in the realm of astrophotography, and I'm super interested to know and learn how they work. And even though I have a full-time job, because the courses are so short and well-explained, I can basically go through one or two lessons whenever I have a little bit of free time to myself, rather than just be mindlessly scrolling through my social networks. It's just so much more fun and it keeps my brain sharp. So if you too want to have fun while learning new stuff and you want to experience Brilliant for free for a full 30 days, you should head over to brilliant.org slash quivlazygeek. 
and the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. And now that we've learned about learning about science, let's go back to the topic at hand with the image that I took. So I'm using a piece of software called PixInsight. That is a very expensive piece of software together with expensive plugins within that software. So really, I'm doing my best to be doing serious astrophotography rather than just toying around. And I have stacked the 2000 frames that we got. Stacking those frames we means we're basically averaging them out against one another to get a better and better signal to noise ratio. And now let's together quickly process the result. So first, let's have a look at how the result even looks like. So let's see, boom, here we have the raw data of the Pac-Man Nebula. And now we'll want to crop the image to just like center the subject and do a lot of manipulations on it to get it better and better. Before we do that though, I want to point out this image there, which looks really weird to most people. This is called a low rejection image. It's generated while we're stacking and it's basically the software telling us where there was overlap between the images that we stacked. And obviously the more the overlap, the better because we are stacking those images. Overlapping them is our purpose. And the more they're overlapping, the darker this image is. The less they are, they are overlapping, the wider the image is. And you can see that we end up with a dark region only at the middle of the image. This is actually due to, the, to a phenomenon called field rotation that always happens with uh, alt azimuth mounts, like the one on the C-Star S50, meaning mounts that can only move horizontally and vertically. But I thought it was really cool to see it manifested like that in our stacking process. And it's for the same reason that if you look at the constellation of Cassiopeia in the sky in the early evening and in the early morning, one time you'll be seeing a W and the other time you'll be seeing an M. This is because it has rotated and that's what happened with the Pac-Man Nebula as well. Okay, so let's get going with the processing. I first do a few steps like removing some of the background color that we see. So let's see how this looks like, a bit more even than before. And then cropping the image so we can center on the nebula itself as well as on the areas of the image that were the most stacked. Therefore, that have the best signal to noise ratio, which is what we're after. Then I do what we call a dynamic background extraction, which allows me to remove the unevenness in the star background caused by the immense amount of light pollution that I have here in Tokyo. And then I use an AI based process to sharpen the image a little bit and also diminish the size of the stars. I then use another AI process to do some noise reduction here. So you can see this is uh, before noise reduction, after noise reduction, very, very different. I then use what is called a stretching process that basically takes the image that has currently very low level of light. Actually, if I don't do any processing on, on it, this is how it looks like. And from this very dark image, and this is because our sensor counted the photons falling from the sky linearly, I stretch it just like our human eyes do automatically. And this is how it looks like after some stretching. The image is very red because most of the color from emission nebulae, like the Pac-Man nebula here, come from the excitation excitation of hydrogen atoms. And the main frequency of that, or the main wavelength, is in the red spectrum at around 656 nanometers, as I recall. And that's, what we get, that's why we get a very red image. But it should be known that we also have some oxygen atoms that get very excited within the nebula. They also emit light, and that's at around 501 nanometers, which is in a blue-green kind of spectrum. And now I'm going to use some processes to tease out that blue-green in the image so we can look at the difference between the oxygen-3 areas and in the hydrogen alpha areas that are emitted by those nebulae. So first I remove the stars using another uh, AI based process and then I apply an automated process that will play with the colors but use what is existing in the image to push the blue to the front and to kind of like remove a bit of the red because the red is so overpowering that we want to reduce it a little bit. But this is the first step and this is where I start using masks and curves to really make the colors of the nebula and the contrast between the hydrogen emissions and the oxygen-3 emissions pop. 
it starts with the hydrogen and I apply some noise reduction a little bit more and then I apply some curves and saturation to get some nice contrast in there and then for a while I will also try to add a bit of saturation to the oxygen three parts of the image so we get more and more of the blue so you can see the core of the nebula has a lot of excited oxygen atoms whereas the periphery has a lot of hydrogen atoms in reality it's really all of the nebula is full of excited hydrogen atoms but we also have in the core of the nebula those oxygen atoms and that's what we capture in those blue tangents here then I do a little tiny bit of sharpening and towards the very end I will place back the stars that we removed earlier. The reason I removed the stars earlier is it makes it much easier to focus and to process only the nebulosity without bothering the star shapes. So now we're placing the stars back. This is how they look like. And the final step is to actually reduce the uh, size of the stars to make them a bit less noticeable on the image so that we still have stars, but we are drawn naturally to the nebulosity, to the nebula, those, to those wonderful excited colors from hydrogen and oxygen. And this is the final result that we get, which I find absolutely astounding. Now, of course, because I'm in Tokyo, I cheated and I used a very expensive filter in front of my Sea Star telescope. But you'd be able to very easily achieve that with just the light pollution filter that is within the telescope if you live like in suburbia, basically, with less light pollution than in Tokyo, which is not very difficult to achieve unless you're living like next to Central Park, in which case you're rich. Congratulations or you're in Hong Kong or Singapore or that kind of city. As always, again, I'll have the links to everything I mentioned in the video down in the description. If you want to support me, by the way, you can like the video, subscribe to the channel, in which case welcome, and more importantly, leave a comment telling me what you think of this. And also, at no cost to you, if you're planning on doing purchasing on Amazon.com or on Agena Astro or on High Point Scientific, if you use the links in the description, it's going to help me at no cost to you. So, hey, why not? But anyway, more important than all of that, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoy seeing what is possible with a toy like this. And I hope you had as much fun as I did taking this image and processing it. Again, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.